Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming, uh, especially at this awkward time slot. Um, we're very glad to see you. And uh, we hope to hear from as many of you as wish to speak, because this really is a workshop. Um, and I uh, hope to you get an um, opportunity to meet each other and network. So I'm Elizabeth Bobrick. I'm uh, one of the co-organizers of this panel. Um, and before I start, I want to give some thanks. Uh, first to, oh, here she comes, the mighty Nancy Rabinowitz. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> who uh, is the founder, if not one of the founders of the Classics and Social Justice Committee, and um, who introduced me to uh, our co-organizer, uh, Danielle Bostic, which is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, the SCS for their support. Um, and um, I would like to thank Helen Catherine Collier, Executive Director, and uh, Brian Shell, who works in the, that office, and they've put out a couple of fires for us. Uh, and you can imagine how much they had to do right before this. So we're very, very grateful. Um, I want to tell you how this panel came to be. Um, as I said, Nancy. This is the Nancy show. Nancy uh, introduced me to Danielle Bostic, uh, Danny. And after really weeks and hours of conversation, um, we, um, we, we wanted to open a collaborative discussion. That was our, our key idea, um, to talk about some fundamental questions about teaching and writing and performing classics now. Um, and our questions, the questions we want to address are these. What counts now as important work? For those of you who are my age, you know that that's changed, right? What counts as important work? Um, who gets permission and material support to do it. And I say gets, I mean it has to be given, right? People have to say, you come and talk, and here's money for you to study. Here's money for you to come to the meetings. Um, how do we make it possible for more people to be recognized as not just nice to have uh, in a group, but essential? So. Our particular aim, too, was to move out of our silos, the professoriate, secondary school teachers, graduate students, independent scholars. Um, we don't often get a chance to hear each other, and we don't often get a chance to be heard, um, especially at the SES, at the annual meetings. Uh, and if we are, it's only as auxiliaries, right? There's a T for secondary school teachers. There are meetings for graduate students. Um, and we feel that people really have something to say to each other and to contribute, and that's why we're here today. Um, now, there are no quick answers to any of those questions that I posed, and there are as our, our panelists will tell you, quite a few moments of, of aporia, if I can repurpose Plato's term for, wow, what do we do now? Um, so we have to talk, and talking also means listening. Uh, so I look forward to us talking and listening, and after our presenters speak, that's what we'll do as a group. Because we're being recorded, it's important to speak into the microphone, unless you want to go into eternity on YouTube, just going. So uh, we have a hand mic up here. We can, I will bring it to you if you want to speak, or if not, I will try to repeat your question. Um, and I look forward to a great panel. Again, thank you for coming.
Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers uh, in the order, not all at once, but as they are about to speak. So first, uh, we're going to hear from Sierra Jones and Sarah Abel Rapp. Um, and they're going to talk about their experiences um, in the University of Michigan's Humanities Emerging Scholars Program, which I think you may be referring to by its acronym, MISHERS. So just what you know what, what MISHERS, MISHERS is. MISHERS are doing it for, MISHERS are doing it for themselves, okay? Um, and, huh? and the, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, reminds me, and the Bridge MA Program. Uh, at Michigan. So Sierra uh, is enrolled in the Bridge Program at Michigan after graduating from Wayne State. Uh, she came as part of the Mishers and has been invited into the PhD program at Michigan for the fall. Uh, Sarah uh, is professor of Greek and Latin at Michigan. She is the Mishers liaison and she directed the Bridge MA program for its first two years. So Sierra and Sarah are going to have a dialogue, as is befitting for a, a classics meeting, and tell us about their experiences. I just want to make sure that this microphone is on. Everyone can hear me? OK. Uh, okay. Let's start. So you go ahead. All right. So um, we would like to start our presentation by talking about uh, the two main goals of our presentation. And um, first uh, being that increasing diversity and inclusivity in classics is, um, is a, will always be a work in progress. Um, there is no finish line. There is no touchdown. Um, you will always have to be working towards um, diversity and inclusivity. And um, second, our second point is that um, different communities and groups need to come together to create these communities um, and these uh, uh, pockets of diversity. Um, it can't just be one person or a, a few people. The entire department needs to be involved um, from the faculty to students and also administrators at the university. Um, diversity and inclusivity cannot exist um, by itself, everybody needs to be involved with it. Um, so those are our two main points uh, going forward with our presentation. Um, and we would like to talk about uh, major obstacles that we face um, at Michigan um, evolving, um, involving um, diversity and inclusivity. So do you want me to? Uh, okay, yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. I, I really agree with you. And you know, I want to reiterate Sarah's point that um, one dropping one person into a non-diverse environment is not that's not sustainable so uh yeah so one of the things uh this whole thing started because the president of the university of michigan president schlissel uh realized that there wasn't a lot of diversity at michigan we have a very very low percentage of diverse undergraduate students and there's a five-year program to try to address that, and included within that is also diversifying the graduate programs. In Michigan, we do have a bit of an obstacle because Proposal 2 passed. And Proposal 2 is a, a modification of the state constitution, and it says that race cannot be a factor in hiring or in admissions to university. I'm sure you've been following the Supreme Court. So we are... Um, and that makes it hard to, to talk about race, to talk about visible diversity, and um, you know, and, and people, and there are tensions around that very fact, and um, and so you know, that's one of the things that we're facing. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I, I would like to say yeah. that because of Proposal Two, um, it diminishes uh, the diversity, like racial diversity while promoting other forms of diversity. I will say that other forms of diversity, such as socioeconomic backgrounds and um, first-generation students are often um, not pushed to the forefront when talking about diversity, even though they um, have um, variant uh, experiences that will be important to the field. However, Proposal 2 um, completely diminishes um, racial um, culture and, and identity um, to prop up um, other forms of diversity, which is harmful 
for um, inc like increasing diversity overall. Yeah, and you know, honestly, in our experience, um, it can set people apart from each other a little bit. Um, instead of embracing the diversity of the collectivity, there can be a kind of um, a kind of sense that hey, I'm being left out, even though I'm diverse. So th that's a problem. Um, so let's let's move on then to the first thing we wanted to talk about was the Mishers program, and this is a this is essentially a summer internship for two years, and the way it works for two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so for two weeks. Yes, and essentially uh, we work with uh, primarily uh, minority degree granting institutions such as uh, CUNY, or uh, we've gone to um, the University of New Mexico, Riverside. And we try to find students who are interested in the classics and not yet enrolled in the PhD program who want to have a taste of what it would be like to be in graduate school, um, have a sense of being mentored by an individual person who is invested in their capacity for doing research, and um, will sort of take many classes in our department. And also, you know, in, in the case, so in Mishers here at, at, at our university, we have English, women's studies, romance languages, Asian languages. That money was melon money, and that money is running out. So we have to figure out ways for the university to invest in this idea that, while that student may not be our student, to put them on the path toward higher education, uh, to uh, postgraduate education. And, and the other one thing I wanted to say was um, that I feel Mishers has been uh, now, we've had that for two years and Sierra was in the first class, and I wanted to uh, kind of give a shout out to my department. You know, we have a big party at the beginning where all the faculty, all the graduate students come and they meet with the Mishers students and they really try to give them a sense that you belong here and that message, you belong here, is a crucial part of changing the face of classical studies. Did you want to yes. say something? And I want to touch on um, the student perspective, student side of the Mishers program. Um, I believe programs like Mishers that uh, allow for students, uh, diverse students, to come together and to meet and to interact with each other is crucial for building diversity and inclusivity, um, especially in our field of classics. Um, for me personally, it was the first time I was in a room where I wasn't the minority. I was, for the first time in my life, I was a part of a majority group, and it wasn't for athletics, and it wasn't for uh, whatever, it was for scholarship. And I got to meet not only other classes from around um, the country, but other scholars in different levels of their education and careers. And it was just so powerful to have that experience um, and also to uh, develop research skills and um, see the resources and see what's possible out there. Um, before Mishers, I had a hard time um, seeing myself um, as a part of the classics community. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have that many role models that look like me, and it's just hard to see yourself when there's no pathway. But um, the Mishers program and programs like that um, allow students to see themselves um, in those situations and can pursue uh, going on in classics. And it was a pivotal moment for me as a person and as a scholar, and I, I really valued it that time uh, there at Mishers, and um, it, it was fantastic. <laughs> um, so, as I said, one of the things that we're talking about is that, you know, you can't do it alone. So, um, kind of reaching out to the community through Mishers is important, but then after two weeks, what do you do then? And that's where the Bridge MA came in. Um, and the Bridge MA is now in its third year. We only can admit two people um, a year, and our first person was Caitlin Mikos, who is now in the PhD program. I wanted to just mention her as the first person brave enough to go through it. Um, so, but the Bridge MA started really on the model of STEM, because in fact, the initial bridge to the PhD programs at Rackham Graduate School, the money was provided by the National Science Foundation. And as a result, they were able to circumvent um, the, the prohibition on recruiting for race. And they could openly embrace the idea of getting a diverse, young group of scholars of color who could come and then change the face of science. 
but we didn't have that luxury when we started Mishers. I mean, uh, the, the bridge program. We are funded through a combination of Rackham, through the college, and through the department. And you know, I want to say again, kind of a shout out to our department. When we, when I initially had this idea for Bridgers, I approached the Department of Art History, the Department of History, the Department of Philosophy, invited them to a meeting with the dean and said, hey, wouldn't this be great? There are no bridge to the MA programs in the humanities anywhere at the University of Michigan. All the sciences are doing it. Shouldn't we do that? Shouldn't we find a way to help people develop so that they can then become uh, strong members of the PhD community? No buy-in from the other departments. So classics you know, had to go it alone. And this kind of does have to do with what we're talking about, about how, um, how it's hard to, to do something apart from um, a larger community, and that we do need to have um, as broad a base and as broad an investment in diversity, not as something exceptional, but just as the way we do graduate school. So that's all I have to say about the Bridge MA. And um, since I am the current student of the Bridge MA, I would like to give my perspective on it. Um, and I have to say that uh, programs like the Bridge MA at the University of Michigan, I feel are incredibly crucial to promoting diversity in classics because they allow for a buffer year between um, what you were doing before and the PhD program. Um, I'm sure you all know that um, one of the ch most challenging things about uh, going on in classics is uh, language acquisition. And oftentimes, uh, it is very difficult for students now to um, acquire a strong background in languages, especially students um, who come from diverse backgrounds or um, people of color who don't get the opportunity to study languages typically um, until um, um, undergrad. And even then, um, that is often not enough to uh, be viable for PhD positions. Um, and because of the uh, lack of Bridge MA programs out there, these students, these scholars are left behind. Um, the Bridge MA program is unique in that it provides scholarship for these students so they don't have to come out of pocket to try to um, uh, fund this on their own. Um, we get um, funding from the Onassis Foundation, which allows us to um, have experiences like study abroad and uh, to do other uh, programs um, around the country that could help us with our languages and um, scholarship, and that is very important. Um, also, the, the Bridge MA um, has funding for its um, MA students uh, for, for tutors, and <laughs> Uh, as I was tutored last semester, and I'll let you know that it was very, very helpful. <laughs> um, and it's, imp it's important to help uh, students out who are struggling. And, um, and I, those resources need to be available from day one so students know that they're not going to be left to dry. Um, and these programs, that, these huge programs that are where, um, where they're combined with PhD students who might not need all the help that they do, they need to feel assured that these resources are here for you and that you need to be able to use them. Um, and I, I wanted to maybe just also mention, is it okay for me? Yes. Yeah, just um, in addition to that, so there is also a teaching component, and so Sarah will be teaching for her first time. And um, you know, I, I think that on the one hand, it's, it's challenging to take on teaching when you're, also, when you're just beginning graduate school, but um, I think it's, 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 it's important for our undergraduates to um, to meet with a diverse uh, group of graduate and student instructors and say, hey, you know, my, my teacher looks like me. I, and that's another way to signal to people, you're welcome here, you belong here. Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I'm excited to teach. <laughs> I'm really excited to teach. I'm also a little nervous, but I, I agree with Sarah in that um, I, I know how like silently important it is to have an instructor that, that looks like you, who you know if you have a problem they could um, better relate to um, what you're going through. And um, when you have, a, like I said, an instructor that looks like you, you're, you feel more included, like this is possible. I, I can go and do what they're doing because look at them, they're up there and they're having a good time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, we also kind of wanted to just maybe in a general way without getting into any specifics, say that 
it hasn't always been smooth sailing. No, it has not. Yeah, and you know, there are difficulties in creating diverse places and classics, and also, of course, you know, tremendous, tremendous rewards. One of the main things that I think is, I can say safely without, again, getting into specifics, is the false dichotomy between elitism and inclusivity that we, what needs dismantling. And, um, but that people who are trained in certain ways, certain traditions, um, might, might carry that dichotomy, ideological divide, into a department in a way that can be, can be harmful. Um, on the other hand, it's also wonderful when uh, the faculty and the graduate students are embracing of inclusivity and, and want to learn what it takes to be a truly inclusive department. Did you want to? Yes, I would like to say, um, touching on that, the, the graduate students at the University of Michigan um, have been fantastic uh, with inclusivity um, and not just diversity. I feel like they um, understand that diversity is just, it's more than you know a few different faces in the crowd. There needs to be inclusivity. People need to feel like they belong there, and the graduate students are very good at making um, MA students um, seem seamless um, in joining uh, the program, which is fantastic. But uh, one problem that is a major problem with classics is this bubble of safety um, that protects uh, privilege and entitlement in the program or in in the field. Um, I mean, I can address that, or do you feel? Well, just the bubble, what we mean by the bubble of safety is that since there aren't a lot of diverse students, um, it's easy to just, to overlook, I mean, frankly, white privilege. You know, it's, it's easy to overlook or not to feel what it must be like to be maybe the only one of two African-American students, um, you know, and maybe like a big company like Ford or, you know, uh, maybe, you know, maybe not Trump's cabinet, but, you know, <laughs> and previous, previous administrations, you know, the idea was like, Diversity is a value, and and that we are be, that we are need to think of diversity as a way to norm the university for certain you know for the for the moral practice of fulfilling the mission of the university, which is to make education massively accessible. And by the very fact of these tiny numbers, then that bubble that exists maybe within a very isolated community um, can sometimes seem normal when it. It really isn't normal at all. Um, so, do you, you want to end with anything? Because we're kind of out of time, but I mean, I feel like. You know, um, I'm sorry, oh, this scared you. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, you, this, is, this is great. And I just want to say um, that we'll have an opportunity. Oh, oh, okay. uh, oh I'm sorry, I took your mic. So, um, uh, I know there'll probably be a lot of questions people have about this fantastic presentation. And so what I'd like to do now is, is uh, move on and then, you know, please let's uh, uh, ask, your, ask your questions, ask more of what you'd like to hear uh, during our, our Q&A session, okay? Thank you so much. I think we have a very fine teacher in the making here. Um, so our next speaker is Danielle Bostic. Um, Danielle teaches Latin in Winchester, uh, Virginia at John Hanley Public High School. Uh, she's on the National Humanities Center Teaching Advisory Council. Uh, she is a TED Innovative Educator. Um, she is a uh, a wonderful writer. Uh, she contributes to Medium, to Sententiae Antiquae. She has some awesome pieces in McSweeney's that you that you really have to look at. Um, so, Danny. Um, so an administrative point before I start, you all have cards near you. If you, um, I mean, I'm hoping we can have a good discussion, but sometimes good discussions, you have questions and we don't get to them. So if you have a question that you don't want to ask in the microphone or you can't get the microphone, uh, pass up your card and we'll either try to address them um, during uh, the discussion time. If you put your email address down and, and uh, direct it to one of us, we can um, get that, get that um, answer to you. So that's what those... Um, cards are um, there for. 
And really what I want to do um, with my time here right now is just sort of set up um, the discussion. Um, I feel fairly strongly that classroom level interventions are really the future of classics, changing your classroom, but that is absolutely impossible if we look at classroom interventions and ignore the culture of classics. Um, so I moved to a small town in Virginia in 2016. I'd lived in Maryland and somehow thought it was maybe just like Maryland South, and then I got there and realized it was not. Um, so my school is very, very diverse. We're a Title I school. I believe about 25% um, of our students are English language learners, um, so, but we also have tremendous wealth. And an interesting thing about my town is that there's no charter school and there's no public school, uh, private school after eighth grade. So really the public school is a place where everybody should be able to learn together. Um, but when I went to work on the first day, my Latin classroom was all white. And initially, I was just a little bit confused. And then I got extremely concerned because even though we have a black mayor, uh, the KKK recruits in town pretty early on. I was at a bar, and there was a team uh, called Mein Kampf. So I started really um, not just looking at my program as undiverse, but looking at it as a segregated space. And the big question I asked myself during that period of time was, if Latin's for everybody, like the sign on my door says, why isn't everybody in my classroom? And the problem is not the composition of the classrooms. It is the culture of classics. Because when we reduce diversity to a PR moment or a way to save the field, we're objectifying people of color by valuing them for their body in the classroom versus potential contributions as colleagues and peers. So I think one of the big problems is that we've been focusing as a field on the composition of our classrooms while ignoring a fairly toxic culture that alienates so many students and frankly is dangerous for white students because in the context of the Klan recruiting and Mein Kampf at the bar, do I want a white student to hear messages in the classroom and see things in his textbook that are the same exact messages as white supremacy groups? And obviously the answer is no. So the problem is not that white students study Latin, it's that the field has excluded students of color through a combination of intentional action and inaction that we have all collectively normalized and accepted. Um, this exclusion has happened through a couple structural mechanisms. Uh, one is by counting Latin as a honors course with coded language like your SAT score will increase. This is for people who want to go to law school or medical school. And in the context of public school, that places Latin into a larger segregatory system completely unnecessarily and unethically. And the second way that the segregation is perpetuated is through a distorted representation of classics that frankly celebrates white dominance. It's a place where rape is framed as a relationship and slavery is framed as a benign work arrangement and then we wonder why our classrooms are all white. Um, in many ways, the field of secondary classics uh, both reflects and perpetuates some of the worst features of our society. And I wanted to set that up because I'm happy to talk about features of my program um, and how I've created a more integrated program, but it's not about marketing and it's not about recruitment because we cannot articulate the value of classics when its value devalues people of color by focusing on Europe and even including Egypt as an honorary, honorary member of Europe. Um, and we cannot reduce the problem of segregation to one of marketing or recruitment 
when recruitment involves bringing students into a classroom where they're going to open up Cambridge Latin or Eke Romani and see slavery glorified, or they're going to take the National Latin exam and see Daphne and Apollo, which is a story about sexual assault, described as a love story. That is alienating and dangerous, and frankly, it's unethical to look at this as a recruiting effort when you're bringing children into a classroom where they're going to be hearing these dangerous messages. And so much of the marketing material exploits manufactured truths to tell a lie both about classics and the people who study them. So what can we do about this? And that's not even the question. The question really needs to be, if you're here, what will you do about this? How will you use your power? We all have power in this room, and many of us have tremendous privilege. How will you use it? Because when you don't, you're hoarding it, and you're preventing marginalized people from having power. You're keeping a big power stash. So that's how I wanted to frame how I see this conversation, because in social media groups, um, lots and lots of different sessions, it really reduces a social justice issue and frankly a civil rights issue in terms of access to education to some sort of marketing thing. And when I hear post-secondary people complain about things that happen at their university, it's, oh, the marketing and businessman came, and it's so terrible because now we have all these weird things happening. And yet when we talk about these critical issues in the field, we become that marketing person and look at this as something to do with expressing the value or conveying the value of classics when we have never demonstrated that we value people of color or any other culture besides European. Um, so where can you use your power? And this is where I looked at the proposal I put in and I just thought, well, that doesn't really sound like something I wrote, but sure enough I did. It was something about existing structures. I was like, oh, okay. Um, there's lots of places you, you can use your power and there's lots of places you can get more power. So you can use your power in the field. Um, that is not safe for everybody. I'm in a position where my job is secure. Even if my school decided I'm just too radical and they don't want me, um, I would be able to support myself with other things. Not everybody's in that position. Um, but if you are, there are many things you can do at the field level um, so that you're not normalizing accepting things that are dangerous. Um, second place is at your school level or your department level. Um, so that's the level where, for example, um, I let the school counselors know that Latin should be treated like any other elective. Any other, like it's like weightlifting, it's like art. And um, that was the single biggest uh, improvement that I was able to make to my program. It changed from one semester to the next. But again, I knew I wasn't bringing students into a classroom where they would be harmed. Um, third place you can use your power is in your actual classroom. And this is where most of the discussion about the future of classics in terms of secondary has, um, has rested. Uh, and really sort of reducing it to an issue of teacher personality, the kind of way you teach. Um, I will say this, you can do grammar translation and have an equitable program. There, this is not an issue linked to your personality. It's not an issue linked to how fun you are. People are free to come into your classroom and like you and your program on their terms, not because you're running a racist segre segregatory classics program at your school. So um, classroom level, there's many things you can do to uh, create an equitable program and an engaging program, but that, that is addressing only that, I think, is part of the reason we're in this situation. And then finally, um, the, where can you use your power when you're interacting with students? And that's where there's the largest power differential. So even in those interactions and the way um, you know, we, we go about our, our daily just routine, greeting students in the hallway, seeing them, emailing them back, I mean, that's another place you can use your power. And all four of those areas are places where you can affect significant change, but only in the context context of understanding what's at stake and what the real problems are, because we're not going to have everybody in the classroom if we're addressing 
symptoms of problems while ignoring um, essentially what I would consider an emergency. Um, and I'm happy to address any of those issues or specifics about my program um, afterwards. If you have questions we don't get to, feel free to use those cards. But I wanted to frame my discussion in terms of what we're doing here, because it's not about the composition of the classrooms. It's about the culture of classics. Thank you, Danny. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Sonia Worcester. Uh, Sonia received her PhD in classics at the University of Melbourne, uh, where she taught Latin, philosophy, uh, and classics. And has also she's also taught at La Trobe University and at Yale, uh, NUS, Singapore. And I'll, I'll ask you to, of course, you'll explain a bit about what Yale and NUS is. Um, uh, she, uh, her scholarly work is on uh, the Epicurean philosopher Philodemus. Uh, she also works on Cicero. Uh, now she lives in New York, and she works at a nonprofit called Marketing Edge, where she is director of academic content and conferences. So welcoming Sonia. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, all right. So with that tone that is unique to only disgruntled teenagers, my students' favorite question last year is, was why do we have to take Latin and why aren't we learning Spanish? This was actually a very reasonable question because to give you some context, it was the only language on offer at the school and it was mandatory for all students to take it. The answer given by the school was that, the study, that studies had shown a link between the study of Latin and higher SAT scores. Regardless of how we all might feel about standardized testing, they're a part of the US school system, so this was a strategic thinking on the school's part. To give you further context, the school where I taught was a Brooklyn Emerging Leaders Academy, an all-girls charter school in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. The majority of students were girls of color, and they entered into high school, shaped by a wide range of New York City middle schools. This translated into students who had a wide range of skills and abilities. A number of students in the ninth grade read at fourth grade level, other students read at level or above level. We had students with IEPs, and everyone was in a single classroom together. Students who, um, in addition to different learning needs, some students entered Latin with a little bit of knowledge about ancient Greece and Rome, but a lot of students came in having never really thought about Roman history, ancient Greece, and they thought that they were going to be learning that Latin and Spanish were the same language. G given the necessity of doing well on standardized tests, not just in high school but also afterwards, the school's decision to offer Latin to help students to grow their base of vocabulary and to improve their problem solving skills, I guess, made sense to them. Of course, students weren't necessarily convinced by this utility argument, and so I'd also have to explain to them a lot of what you do at high school, like algebra, for example, might not seem very relevant to life, but high school is actually about teaching you to think as well. Their questioning about why they had to learn Latin prompted me to continue to examine the place of Latin and classics more generally in education. What are we preparing students for at both the college and high school level? What does Latin and classics offer that other subjects don't? Well, the obvious answer is that classics offers students knowledge about ancient Greece and Rome. So, and there's also no doubt too, to quote Dan L. Um, Padilla Paralta, that the societies of ancient Greece and Rome oversaw the rise and development of literary, artistic, philosophical, political, legal, and scientific projects that have shaped and remain vitally important to contemporary life, end quote. Our architecture, literature, political systems, and more go back to Greece, Greek and Roman activity. For me in Brooklyn, I found that Latin, when mandatory, was actually an amazing equalizer. Every single ninth grade student who had to take Latin, which was everyone in the school, all came in with the same amount of Latin, which was none. So students who struggled to read English because of the deeply flawed New York City educational system were suddenly on equal footing with students who read at or above grade level. And this was reflected in their grades. Often the students who had lower reading levels did just fine in their Latin class. 
It was also an opportunity for students to learn about past cultures in a school system where they'd learnt a lot about American history, but not very much about anywhere else. In essence, Latin came, became a way to globalise the past and to make it relevant in today's society. As much as possible, I integrated the study of culture into classes. So, for example, in one lesson, students learned about the lives of women in Chateau Huyuk, where women had held equal status with men. Then we looked at ancient Sumeria and looked at the first laws that started to restrict women's rights. We looked at the legacy of gender inequality in ancient Greece. And then they watched a short documentary about the lives of four sisters in Rome. Created by Ray Lawrence, the short video focused on the four Domitias, and the girls were fascinated by the fact that all of the sisters had to share the same name. And um, it, the story of the little video talked about societal norms in ancient Greece and Rome for women. The girls were particularly vociferous about Roman women's value being exclusively tied with the number of children they had, and it generated a great deal of debate as to the treatment of women in modern America. Students also took an ethnic studies class. So in place of English at this school, they had ethnic studies. And that gave them the tools to think critically about how people are represented in literature, art, and popular culture. They used these tools in the Latin class. So for example, they had to read an adapted version of Catullus, and they thought about how women are depicted so negatively by Catullus. They also had a class where they were able to look at statues of Romans in their togas versus non-Romans, and they had to think a little bit about the way that Romans used colour, clothing and hairstyles to differentiate between themselves and people in their empire. My teaching at Bella, with its focus on ethnic studies, was informed by my experiences in Australia at the University of Melbourne and La Trobe University and Yale and US in Singapore. 0.3% of Australian students have access to Latin or classics at school. That's a very small, it's under a percent of people. So that means when they came into uni the university system, their knowledge of ancient Greece and Rome was largely informed by popular culture. Moreover, the students that I taught came from diverse linguistic and cultural backgrounds, and they didn't necessarily have the same historical connections to European or Anglo-Australian heritage. More than 30% of Australians now are born overseas, so it's a very high percentage of the population. The so-called canon of ancient Greek and Roman texts was meaningless to these students, and it gave me the opportunity to, think, to reconsider what texts I taught and how I taught them. My perception of Latin and classics was particularly altered by my experience of teaching at Yale and US College in Singapore. Uh, Mira Sayo, who works at Yale and US, recently wrote an article about how her time at the college has changed her understanding of how classics can position itself. In her article entitled Classics for All, Future Antiquity from a Global Perspective, she argues that going it alone is not the best op option for any discipline in the humanities anymore, that the future of classics lies in its ability to position itself in a transdisciplinary conversation. Having taught into the common curriculum, which is uh, all students at Yale and US have to take um, the same core subjects in the first year. Of um, and she, her nearest comment is that, quote, this may mean sacrificing some prestigious real estate on the syllabus and checking our own disciplinary sense of privilege as the fonds et erogio of Western civilization. And that comment resonated deeply with me. Exposure to the common curriculum at Yale and US prompted me to think carefully about how classics positions itself in relation to other tr cultural traditions, making me more aware of the ne necessity of including texts from lots of different traditions. So for example, Literature and Humanities 1 at Yale and US includes Chinese, Indian, Arabic, and ancient Greek texts. And students are encouraged to think about the way these texts relate to one another in terms of techniques and themes. Asking students and instructors to think about the similarities and differences between texts makes us all aware of our own biases. At the same time, however, it opens up new ways of thinking about texts with which we may be very familiar. A concrete example of this might be when um, I was teaching Sima Chen, the Chinese historian, and he talks about Bactria, the, the same area that Strabo talks about. And I'd done my master's on Strabo, so I remember reading that, that section. These two writers discuss the same part of Central Asia completely differently. By reading them side by side, 
myself and students were able to think about the social and cultural and political reasons why the Greek geographer and the Chinese historian focus on such different aspects of Central Asian culture and politics. Moreover, I think positioning classics together with other fields like Africana and Asian studies ref reflects contemporary society in a way that it doesn't in isolation. I wish to end on a bit of a personal note. Writing this paper for me was a little bit, bit of a bittersweet experience. Um, since submitting my abstract for this panel, I've had a significant change in my life and after more than 15 years of teaching classics and Latin at university level and also a little bit at high school, I decided to change careers. And this decision was prompted not by a desire to move away from teaching, which I love and I miss a lot, but by a realization that I, um, the high school teaching environment didn't really work for me. Um, I loved the students, but the way schools, high schools are run, um, I didn't really enjoy that. And um, I was also unwilling to return to the relentless, precarious world of untenured and um, adjunct academic jobs. So that's why I now am doing something completely different, um, although I still continue to do my own research. So thank you very much. Well, I didn't know that there was any Chinese writing about Bactria. Uh, that's wild. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. We, in addition to being in our own silos in America, uh, I at least tend not to think about classics taught outside of America except in Britain and Germany and France, places, you know, in Italy where, you know, places where scholarship emerges that we need, we need to read. Um, so this is, this is really important uh, and interesting. Um, so our next uh, and uh, final speaker is Nina uh, Papathanasopoulou. Uh, Nina works on ancient drama, uh, mythology, and its reception. Uh, she has a PhD in classics from Columbia University, and she taught at Connecticut College from 2013 to 2019 uh, as a visitor. Uh, she's now joined the faculty of the college year in Athens. Um, her current research explores interpretation of Greek myth through the dancer and seminal choreographer Martha Graham. Uh, she's also public engagement coordinator for SCS. Uh, she oversees the Classics Everywhere initiative and supports programs that engage in interdisciplinary collaboration and bring the study of the Greco-Roman world to new audiences and uh, broader public. So please welcome Nina. And I'm just going to turn on the machine. And OK. Okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank both Elizabeth and Danny for um, including me and inviting me in this panel. And I'm very um, excited to be here and share my own views um, on teaching at the undergraduate level. So I'm actually going to be teaching. I'm going to be talking about the undergraduate level and um, what I did there um, to increase diversity and accessibility to the classics classroom. So my talk would like to suggest that by incorporating the visual and performing arts in classics courses, teachers can make their courses more accessible and attractive to a more diverse group of students. During the talk, I will present responses from students of color who took classics courses with me at Connecticut College, where I taught for the last six years, and who participated in trips to exhibitions and performances as part of those courses. So first, I'd like to start with a few thoughts from the students themselves about why students of color may not want to take a classics course. So one um, student who identifies as a Latina said, I often find myself having to explain and justify 
to my non-white friends why I study classics. I love classics and think it has been the most rewarding part of my studies in college, but I still grapple with what it means for me to have chosen to study the foundation of Western history as opposed to gravitating towards my own culture. A student um, who identifies as a student of color and was a first generation student said, I think that not all people from all backgrounds would find the Greco-Roman world worth studying, mostly because I feel that they would probably think that it has no relation to them. But I feel that they should study these worlds as they played a large role in shaping the world we live in today. A Cuban American student said, in the US K through 12 classrooms, erase and ignore the history of minority students and focus instead on teaching and reinforcing a white Western identity. Many minority students upon going to college will wanna get away from this kind of teaching and immerse themselves in non-Western studies. According to these students, some students of color may not find classics courses relatable. In, a, in addition, many students feel that in classics courses, and I guess in the humanities more generally, they learn things that are not directly applicable to their lives or careers. Now, um, from my first semester at Connecticut College, I realized that I had to do sort of something different in order to make uh, my classes more inclusive and more attractive. And um, what I did was that I decided that in, my major in the majority of my classes, I would include trips to um, exhibitions and performances that were happening in the larger area of Connecticut, um, also in Providence, also in New York City, and in Boston. And since I had done my PhD at Columbia and I was there for so many years in New York, um, it was easy for me to actually find those places and know where to take them and sort of make those connections. So um, some examples of the trips um, that I took with the students. First of all, um, I took them to take um, Richard Strauss Opera of the Electra at the Metropolitan Opera. I also took them to see Aquila Theater's production or Trojan War at BAM. Um, this production re-envisions scenes of Homer and Greek tragedy in the modern setting of the Middle East with US soldiers interacting with the local people in the countries of the Middle East where they're at. I also took them to take Martha Graham's Greek-inspired dances. Um, Cave of the Heart is one inspired by the myth of Medea, and Night Journey by the myth of Oedipus and Jocasta at the New York City Center. I took them to see Marcus Gardley's Black Odyssey, a Trinity rep in Providence with an all-black cast, um, black director, and everybody involved in the stage crew, um, black as well. I also took them to Luis Alfaro's Mojada, um, which is a re-envisioning again with Medea making her a Mexican immigrant in the US um, at the Public Theater in New York. I also took them to multiple performances by the Barnard Columbia Ancient Drama Group in New York, um, which predicts makes, uh, sorry, produces um, works in the original Greek and Latin. I also took them to the Greek and Roman galleries at the Met, um, the Slater Museum, which is a local museum in Norwich, Connecticut, the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, an exhibition um, on the hymn to Apollo. So this was um, how the uh, Greco-Roman world had inspired and influenced the dance world, and, and particularly the Ballet Russe in the beginning of the 19th, sorry, the, eight, the 20th century and then also um, this recent exhibition on the ancient Middle East um, at the Met this last uh, May. Now, as you can see, I aimed for a variety of venues and types of theater, from the New York City Center here, to, we went to see the Martha Graham Dance Company, to the Black Odyssey um, this last January. And um, whenever I could, I also tried to include uh, talkbacks with the directors, the actors, um, the dancers, the curators involved. And even though at the beginning um, I started having these trips be sort of volunt, like anybody who wanted to could go, then I decided that I would make, make them mandatory and sort of an integral part of the classroom. And students had to write papers afterwards or um, submit reviews or submit reviews for the student paper, like the college, Connecticut College student paper or write for the student experience blog that the Connecticut College had on their website. So somehow after that to actually reflect on this and include it in their work um, for the classroom. Um, so um, the reason why I included these trips was you know, primarily because I thought they were interesting, but also because I thought that this these would make my students feel more connected sort of to the material that they were studying um, if they actually went and saw the art artifacts and they actually went and saw the actual performances where people had done things right that were influenced by the ancient world. 
Now, with time, I realized and saw that these trips started um, making my classes more diverse, and they really started attracting a more diverse group of students to my courses. I think they made my courses accessible to students of a greater variety of learning styles, addressing sort of how we teach, right? A visual learner, perhaps somebody, um, an oral learner maybe um, really was attracted and wanted to be part of these trips, but also to students of a greater variety of interest, perhaps addressing what we teach, sort of the content of our classes. Um, in addition, I think these trips also responded to the students' concern that humanities subjects are not directly applicable to their lives, because by incorporating the visual and performing arts, it made their study um, a lot more concrete, tangible, and worth their while. One student, a Cuban-American student, reported, when speaking to my family about my courses, they don't understand why I'm studying classics, nor do they have much interest. But when I bring up theater and the arts, they seem to comprehend it much more easily. A first-generation student of color said, we got to see how important the subject is to the rest of the world. Another student said that going to museums and performances makes things feel less arbitrary and more concrete, while a student from Mexico said that these museums and performances help them see how the legacies of these classical myths are still relevant. By taking students... By taking students to museums and performances, these students leave their institution and become directly connected to a larger interest in the humanities that's thriving outside their academic classroom. And they mingle with artists and attendees from a variety of backgrounds that are interested in different aspects of the Greco-Roman world. It's really important for students to see that there is an interest in the humanities outside their classroom. And it's really interesting to take those students um, to those places so they can see and they can mingle with that interest. Now, um, students want to feel seen in the material they study. So for example, one student said that it's easy to feel separate from the classics as a Latina, but seeing that performance of the Medea, where the Medea was like a Mexican immigrant, really spoke to her. I'm sorry, I'm just going to skip some of these. Um, students also want to feel connected to other people. So an African-American student said that my classics courses don't sp necessarily speak to my identity in terms of race or gender, but they definitely speak to me as somebody who loves history, culture, and language. Students also commented that, to sum up, I guess, students talked about their connection with the real world, the relevance of the material, like these trips bring up the relevance of the material. These trips bring out the timelessness of the material. Um, they also bring up the variety of interpretations that this material can provide to them. So by seeing different um, performances, they see how differently each culture can interpret these things. They also talked about how they understood the material much better. And they also talked about how the material, um, they had a better emotional response toward those mat the material. And so to be able to feel emotional towards what you're studying is obviously crucial to what you're studying. Um, they also felt that they partook a little bit in the experience of the ancients, because the ancients were such an oral culture with performances and art being so um, prevalent in their lives. And finally, they also thought that it made them bond with other students, which I think is also crucial for everybody to feel um, welcome in the classroom. Um, so I think for all of these reasons, including these in the classroom, made my classes more relatable and the material more relatable, sorry, and accessible um, to students of color and to sort of students from a variety of backgrounds in my classroom. And I'm happy to talk more about any of this um, during the Q&A that will follow. Thank you. Uh, so thanks to Nina for that that great presentation, and I would have loved to have gone on some of those trips myself. Um, so time for question and answer. Uh, okay, the gentleman here. Is it on? Is it on? Rock the mic. Yeah. yeah okay. There we go. Great. Uh, this question is for uh, Sonia Rooster. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. It was really. Uh, and all the variety of contexts in which you taught, it was really inspiring to hear those stories. Uh, thank you, and especially someone who taught really next door to where you did. I really appreciated that. So you mentioned the need to sacrifice real estate on our syllabi in order to reach a wider audience. 
Um, does some of this sacrifice entail eliminating or reducing the study of Greek and Latin as languages? If yes, why? Okay, great question. I think a lot of departments are facing that. Um, sure. um, so that was actually a quote from Mira, who I worked with at Yale and US, but um, it, it's actually, at Yale and US it was quite interesting because they didn't originally plan to offer um, so Sanskrit or Latin or ancient Greek, but then student demand after taking the classes in translation, they've actually in, in, in put it into the as an option after in like second and third year. So I don't see them as in you know if you're getting rid of um, certain texts that you're not going to study, that doesn't mean you have to also get rid of the languages. So I don't see that as like an issue at all. So yeah. Panelists would uh, like to respond to that as well. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, Oh, uh, during the mistress program of the summer. So the mistress program was set up that um, you would come in either with an idea of what you want to research or already um, a research topic in progress. A lot of the students, actually majority of the students in my um, cohort were already um, MA students who were working on their thesis um, to apply to PhD programs. Um, when I was in Mishers, I was an undergraduate student who had no research experience or um, really no research project to speak of. So um, when I was there in my experience uh, under uh, the mentorship of Celia Schultz, I was able to develop um, a better understanding of uh, a topic that I was just interested in um, at the time. I was mostly reading um, Latin poetry, so um, my senior thesis was going to be on the Aeneid, and when I went there, um, she introduced me to this fabulous um, author called Lucretius, who... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's very similar to the Aeneid, um, and while the courses and um, the roundtables that are there uh, were to simulate what it would actually be like um, going to the University of Michigan, they were different and um, they were tailored to the students. Um, needs. So my um, courses that are my um, meetings with my mentor looked different um, because I had different strengths and weaknesses. Yes. The Bridge MA, so we don't have, mostly don't have MA students. And this is what I was trying to say that by and large, well, I, I know like Berkeley, you know, you go through an MA, but by and large, the PhD programs in Rackham in our depart, in our school, they recruit PhD students. And then this, then the, you know, the, men, the faculty advisors fight over, you know, the PhD students. Like, oh, you know, you got a Latinist last time, so we're having mm -hmm. a hell of this this time, you know, and, you know, and so, the idea is that instead of it just being about how many students a certain person with a large ego can acquire, it's about helping to, you know, putting resources into the development of a student. And so our Bridge MA students take classes alongside our other students. They take them alongside them, um, and they, they work alongside them at all times. To, to be successful PhD students, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
I have a question uh, for Nina. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the logistics and funding for the trips? Because there, uh, <laughs> because there are so many performances and trips. How do you fund it? And how do you make them all come together and you know transport to the place you need and then transport back? So this is, I think, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am um, for so just in terms of how to get to all these places, I did order buses, and buses are very expensive. But the truth is that if you take mul multiple trips to places, buses make discounts for you. So I became like best friends with a bus company, I have to say. And then I use them for other purposes too. So that's one thing. But um, in terms of, of funding, I did um, do lots of efforts to get funding for all these trips. There was a uh, student faculty engagement fund at Connecticut College, and I always applied um, for money from that fund, which was very supportive. There was a president's fund and I applied for that. The dean of the college actually said that if any of the students couldn't afford the trip sometimes, so the trips were not totally free. There was a small amount that students had to pay because after the first time that I offered a free trip, I realized how many could just cancel last minute. So I think that if they pay even a little amount, they feel a little bit more committed to going. So I always said, um, this is the amount that people are going to pay, but if you can't um, afford it, then please let me know. Um, it's going to be confidential. The dean of the college has a budget to actually support everybody. So everybody could go on the trip. Nobody was left behind. And um, I also asked for a funding from the departments, so from the classics department, but also like when I went to the opera, the music department, and actually a music professor came along too to the trip um, for the dances from the dance department, so the different departments that were around. And um, I feel that the all the feedback that we got from the students and the fact that I soon started encouraging them to write for the student paper or for the student blog or all these things really made um, the administration see how important these trips were for them. And they really wanted to highlight those trips. And so I think that really made my funding chances sort of go up. Um. I, I loved all of your guys' presentations and strategies that you're bringing forward. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I wanted to ask, and this any of you feel free to respond, um, as someone who is a student but like transitioning into trying to become an educator, I finished my master's, um, I'm applying for PhDs right now, um, how do, or do you, have you guys thought it through any strategies around like, holding colleagues accountable, specifically um, around questions of diversity in the field. And I want to be like very clear. I just did my master's at Columbia. I frequently had colleagues asking me, as they should, because I'm always a, I'm all about inclusivity, uh, about why there weren't more students in our field, in our program. Um, and like, I thought they were just lazy historians because I was like, why don't you look at the history of Columbia, our institution? Why don't you look at Dunning, who was a classicist and historian in the early 20th century who created the Dunning School of Thought with his students, which was the ideological bedrock of Jim Crow. Like, if, we, if classics has always been used, especially in our country, as a tool of supremacy and like as a tool, also common sense, we're on a marble structure overlooking the rest of Harlem. Like, there is not a good relationship there. Uh, like, how do we like hold like this sudden lack of critical thinking that like so many of our colleagues can have around issues of inclusivity and race and like just kind of like rampant uh, individualism and lazy practice. Um, and also like in thinking forward towards action and not just like rhetoric anymore. Um, do you any, if do any of you guys, I do, uh, do any of you guys think that uh, we need to start conceptualizing what classical academic reparations looks like. Um, I definitely think that there needs to be a three to five year long reparation period where 
professional organizations enumerate and apologize for extremely specifically what they've done to the field and what they've how they've exploited classics. Um, so far, most statements have been completely performative. So off the top of my head, I think something we can all do is when a professional organization releases a statement that calls exclusion a misunderstanding, that we don't accept that as, oh, look what a great thing this organization has done. Or when they condemn white supremacy as if it's over there in a hate group when their appropriation of classics is almost exactly the same and can be taken as is and exploited by hate groups, then no, we don't accept that. I think that there needs to be some pressure because when an organization releases a statement, they get to control the story and the narrative. And when people accept it, you're helping them create a story that white supremacy is not a problem in the field. So I think that's an easy way that people could get involved. If you're not comfortable doing it publicly, you can send a letter. I mean, there could be department. I'm sure there's different infrastructures, different places. But I think we've collectively normalized this idea that, you know, as you were saying, all of a sudden we're lazy and we're not going to teach history, uh, um, myth as history for black Athena, but we're totally fine doing that in secondary classics in almost every single resource we have. I mean, there's definitely a double standard that the field has collectively endorsed. And I think that's one of the easiest ways to get involved is to not accept the narrative that this isn't a problem. And when there's a statement that's entirely performative, send a letter. Do something on social media. Call someone you know at the organization if you have that level of access, but don't just let it slide like, oh, this is what they say that's the truth. Sorry, yes, I also have something to say about that. Um, I believe that communication um, is very important, especially in this issue. Um, I don't want to uh, be an apologist for people who make um, ish, like problems or are problematic, but I believe that if we talk about issues more and instead of being incredibly reactive to uh, t topics and issues that come up in the field, um, we can it would be uh, much better. Um, a lot of times, people don't um, they don't understand. Like I, like I, like I touched I touched on in my um, a little bit in my talk, there's bubble of privilege. I can um, only imagine that if your worldview is the default, it is really difficult to see other perspectives or to even put yourself in a sympathetic or empathetic um, situation to even um, consider someone else. We need to be way more open about um, being sympathetic and empathetic. We need to have these conversations, these very difficult conversations with each other um, about uh, inclusivity and diversity. Um, and I think um, that would help. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we, um, and you know, one of the things that we were saying was that diversity is a work in progress, and and there have been some stumbling blocks in, in trying to diversify the classes department in Michigan. There's there have been misunderstandings. There have been there's been envy. There's been there's been a lot, and um, it's been pretty hard to take actually. So there's a lot of support for it, but, but, but individuals, I think, may not have, as Sierra's saying, that, that like, experience, wisdom, culture, curiosity, commitment, um, passion, and, and that, those are hard things to transmit to, you know, the community as a whole. For sure, they are. Sarah, this is sort of a follow-up to what you just described, because when you said you were, went to other departments to try to enlist their cooperation or participation in this plan, the bridge project, what were the excuses they gave you for not doing something yeah. that seemed so manifestly sensible? Yeah, you know, I, I was really shocked. Um, one th one thing was um, we had to extract a guarantee. And this is something that, for some of you who are interested in bridge programs, we, we eventually extracted a guarantee from Rackham that students admitted through the bridge 
would automatically be given a rack of merit fellowship, so essentially pay for their own funding. So the the people were like, you know, we, we're going to give something to these MA students, but but we can't do that because you know that would take away from our brilliant you know pro, uh, our brilliant professors no who like have their cadre of students and so essentially it had to become sort of mercurial like okay well maybe these students can pay for themselves like yeah you know we the rackham will will give them a merit fellowship so essentially you know you're not losing anything people are you know they're very I don't know what's the word mercurial uh, exchange oriented, but yeah, a, a lot of it transactional. Yeah, you know that that was one thing. Other people said crazy things like, I don't want to name names, but <laughs> the chair of the department at the time of philosophy said, <laughs> said said this, like, we don't have a diversity problem, you know. I'm like, really? Because you know I've been at Michigan for almost thirty years, and I have. We, we are down the hall from you guys in philosophy, and yes, you have a diversity problem. Um, I'm not sure what that even meant, you know? I'm not, you know, yeah. It's... Um, just as a, a follow-up to Vanessa's question, and to what you'd said, Sarah, uh, do people have thoughts about, I mean, increasing diversity does mean people have to give something up. Like that is, and I think the fact that you were having to kind of walk on eggshells and move around this, I think, I feel like that is a conversation that we need to be having a lot more openly, that like, if it is a zero sum game for funding, someone's gonna have to give something up and we have to be, that is the cost, uh, if we want to call it uh, classical studies reparations, if we want, like someone is going to have to lose a spot in a program, and that that's what we need to commit to do if we want to we want to change the face of the field. And I think, uh, you know, I just would like to hear people's thoughts about. I know there's a lot of pushback on that front, um, and I think that's where a lot of people get very. Everyone likes the idea of diversity until like the rubber hits the road, and you have to actually say like, you know someone is going to have to give something up. Um, and so I I don't know, I just would like to hear people's thoughts about about what that conversation is looking like, what it could look like. Um, I mean, I, I just want to say really quickly that we are not giving something up by diversifying classics. We need to give up our white, monolithic attitude if classics is going to survive. People of diverse backgrounds have something to give to us. We will not survive as the all-white discipline. We have nothing to lose by this. We are not. This is what people, I think, don't understand. This is crucial. We will not survive into the 22nd century as um, somebody that's, as, as a group that's associated with white supremacy, as an all-white group that can't reach out, and also the great classicists of the 20th and 21st century, Toni Morrison, Louise Alfaro, um, you know, Alice Walker, uh, I mean, these people have everything to give to us. So we, I mean, we're not diverse. We're, we have nothing to lose. We have so much to gain. And it's a danger. It's a danger to think that way. No, yeah, sure. I I don't, I don't want to be misconstrued. Yeah, I, sure, I, just sure. want, I just want to be clear yeah. that the... You know, if if we are talking about a set, because this is, this is where a lot of conversations fall apart, is there will be sort of the quote about like when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Like we're going to have to reckon with the yeah. fact that mm -hmm. there are going to be people who are used to having the spots and the things, and and no one wants to say maybe that is going to have to change. So they say like it will be fine. White men will be fine. I mean they. They will, but we were we were unwilling to say that maybe maybe fewer maybe fewer white men will be admitted to a philosophy department, and and I think the fact that we are not willing to because because the conversation breaks down because people say how impossible, and you had, you had to get funding elsewhere for because of exactly this idea of people feeling like they're going to have to something is taken away that is owed to and and I think so it's more around the how do we have this conversation so. Um those feelings that um, to increase diversity, we have to give up something. 
um, comes from a place of entitlement and privilege that um, I like. Uh, I can yes, that you know, um, I went to this uh, elite school and I have all the credentials. And why do I have to give up my spot to someone who doesn't have all the credentials that I do? Um, and that that stems from this belief that this person deserves this only simply because you know of that. I mean, it, it's privilege. Um, we have to be able to number one recognize it in ourselves and other people and call it out um, so uh, we can move forward with diversity. That diversity does not take away um, opportunities from other people and enhances can, um, diversity. I mean, and, and, sorry, it enhances and um, increases opportunities for other people. It makes the field better. Um, like uh, Sarah said, we're we're not losing anything. We're, we're gaining so much. Um, we need to change how we think about. Uh, Funding and um, increasing diversity um, as not you know a give and take. It's not a in some zero sum um, situation. You know, we had a really really intense conversation about this, um, but I don't want to you know get into specifics. But um, and I really uh, don't know the answer. Like I actually started to think that maybe. Our entire department should read White Fragility, or you know, just like wh what should we do to really just have this conversation more in the open and just allow, p educate people about how they haven't questioned their their privilege. I mean, a lot of people say, "I don't see race." Yeah, you don't see race until the the, the person of color has you know your spot. Well, why was that your spot? You didn't do anything to earn that. You you've just always had that spot. So yeah, I definitely think we need to, to think through ways of having a dialogue that doesn't put the burden on the diverse person or the person running the diversity program. Um, yeah, and I think that's a great question. And I think outside of resources, I mean, at the secondary level, my, it's a public school. There's not um, the same issues that there are at post-secondary. But uh, the big loss there is prestige, because the entire secondary classics representation is, is heavily favored towards, it's a celebration of whiteness. So that would be a pretty big shift to have a representation of classics that doesn't celebrate Eurocentrism in that way in our textbooks and our teaching materials. And then there, well, white people aren't so special anymore. So that there would be not just a money issue. I suspect in that case, people would be from throwing some money around pretty fast. Let's leave this be and here have some money because I think people are used to Latin being a celebration of European culture, which is white culture. Um, so that's something that I think is uh, you know, outside of the funding issues and who's taking which spaces. When we open up a textbook, who, who do we see in there and what culture is the best? Um, so that's something I see in, in my sector and I know you had your hand up. Hi, uh, proud Michigan PhD here and I have a question for- Go blue. Yes, go blue. Uh, question for our Michigan folks um, and this is partly based out of my own experience. Um, I was hoping you could comment on maybe some of the internal discussions that you've had at Michigan or in the department about this kind of general issue of cohort size. We're a small field, we've got a small pool, and a very narrow path uh, that is increasingly narrow to a long-term career in this field. And part of why I chose Michigan was because it had some diverse faculty. Pretty much all, all of them were pretty much gone by the time I became a candidate. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I chose, the program had some diverse students in it, and by the time I became a candidate, they'd either graduated or they'd left the program, um, and not, maybe none followed me. Uh, I remember going to the Rackham Merit Fellowship events with a group of students initially, and then by the end, I was by myself from Classics. Um, well, no, I was, the, I was the only student of color uh, representing the department. Um, and all of, these hap all of these things happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, and because we're dealing with a, just a handful of people, uh, a, a variety of reasons, maybe none of which were the fault of the department, but maybe some were, uh, I find myself alone. So as a department that's concerned about building a diverse cohort, uh, what are you doing to address these kinds of issues? And then also, you know, what are you doing 
about, <laughs> about expanding or trying to fight against the forces that are narrowing the ability for people to have any kind of permanent career in the field? Um, that, is, that is a great, important question. And I want to um, invite other people in the, in the audience who are wrestling with these issues in their schools, institutions, to contribute as well. All right. And any, any of our other panelists, of course. Yes. Well, um, I've only been at the University of Michigan for now about five months, so I can only uh, speak about uh, my limited experience there. Um, and my experience is mostly with the graduate students. And although it is um, majority um, non-people of color, I would say that the students there um, seemed they are very active in activism, and they are very progressive and forward-thinking. Um, they, um, one student in particular um, goes out of their way to in invite uh, new students or people who might be on the fringe um, who don't feel excluded to events and invite them over and just have a good time. Um, and that builds community. Um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know so much about the, the professors. I've only met the five of them. <laughs> there, there were a lot there. Uh, but I feel that community at the graduate uh, student level is super important, um, especially if you are um, one or two, um, you know, a person of color in a department that is not super diverse. Um, we need to encourage our graduate students to not just, you know, um, say, oh, yeah, that's a diverse person. They're here. We're good now. No, you need to include that person. You need to, you know, help them out a little bit, make them feel included. Um, it's very important. I mean, one, one idea that I had was um, I, I think that because we are a small cohort, I've been trying to get uh, the idea of a humanities students of color um, writing workshops. I think that we do need to build with other departments. There just are too few people. And I think that we need to, you know, have Rackham invest in that so that um, there's a core host of people coming up in the humanities and, you know, they're doing work together and pursuing their professional goals together and networking. So I think that, you know, given the smallness of classics, that's why I tried to reach out to the other programs. I absolutely, you know, share your concern that, um, this is what we said at the very beginning, that it's, it's hard to go it alone. And you had that experience of going alone. You know what it's like. So I really appreciate your comment. Um, I come from a department that uh, has been very supportive at the University of Maryland. My colleague, Lillian Darty, uh, can testify she's here with us, to increasing our diversity. But all of the issues that we've been talking about are connected in a negative feedback loop. Um, in the last five years, we had a wonderful major, an African-American student, a wonderful major, a woman of Latina ancestry. They loved the classics. They both went to Harvard Law School huh. because they saw that the very lack of opportunity that um, our colleague mentioned earlier meant that this was a very perilous pathway to follow. And so if we cannot represent diversity in our field in the classroom, we discourage students of diversity to coming, from coming to our classrooms. And even when they do, if we can't show them there's a future yeah. uh, in our field, then they're not going to stay for very long. And I wish I were wise enough to know how we get out of this loop, but I don't. It's, uh, it involves, I, I think, um, a lot of difficult conversations, unfortunately. Like, mm -hmm. there is no simple solution. Uh, it, it's going to be a work in progress oh. for a long time. I can predict. <laughs> oh, yes, right, right, right. Sorry about that. Um, I also, um, I, I don't know their situations, um, and I don't know your situation or um, any other person of color, but I do know that um, it, 
ex external things that they see and you know feel that there there is a narrowing path to um, a tenureship or a professorship um, in classics, but there it could also be because of um, internal problems um, in their own communities. I can only speak for myself, um, but uh, traditionally. Um, in the African American community, um, pipelines to success uh, were in the STEM fields, and um, I experienced that. And I somewhat still not for my parents; they they're on board now. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, there's this notion that if you are not a doctor and you're not a lawyer and you're you're trying to do something in languages of all things, then um, you're not going to bring up your people, you're not going to bring up your family, and you're not going to be successful. There is that pressure to, um, I don't know what made them change their minds, but I think people, uh, especially um, educators, need to keep that in mind, that you might be doing all the right things and um, supporting your students, but there is like an internal uh, struggle and strife with, um, I think, people's identity. Like, how do I um, combine my identity as a classicist while also um, keeping my identity, my racial identity or cultural identity? And those two are often at odds. So that is another um, issue that there is no simple answer and I don't have an answer for it because I struggle with it myself so um, I just wanted to, to throw that out there so people can just be aware that that's that's something that um, a lot of minority students um, struggle with and experience. In terms of um, I mean just a history of classics in the United States um, there is a golden age of classics around the time like after the Civil War so around um, the time that industrial education came about and um, I mean, there is a lot of literature and a lot of research on early black classicists, and they viewed classics as their own heritage, the building blocks for their culture once um, they, were, they were free. And that's something that the professional organizations have robbed classics of by creating essentially the classics that we have now where people can't reconcile a non-white identity with their interest in classics. So back to Amy's question about reparations, I mean, there needs to be a counterfactual and a retrieval of what could have been. What would the field have been like if ACL in 1919, who was founded to promote classical education in the United States, had advocated against the elimination of classics programs at black universities? What would have happened if, when we're developing textbooks, um, you know, we, we thought about, okay, we're not colonizers anymore. Why were we ever, um, you know, demeaning people of color? This needs to change. So there has to be a counterfactual that addresses what could classics be based on what the field intentionally cut out of classics because there's a myth that um, black Americans were studying classics to become white, but they were using classics to build up uh, a culture, and there's research, I mean, um, Dr. Goings and Dr. O'Connor up at, um, if you're interested in looking at that, um, at Ohio State. Do you have a follow-up to that? Okay, and then I'm gonna. Just a quick addendum. Um, also, uh, just to patch on to that, not only was this notion of like, black people learning Greek and Latin to be white, but also um, a lot of scientific racism went explicitly into stating that black people were inherently inferior to white people because they were incapable of reading Greek and Latin. Um, and then you had slaves teaching themselves Greek and Latin to combat that, it's wild. Uh, most notably Phyllis Wheatley, um, who then Jefferson actually took to task writing reviews of her Latin poetry and insisting that black people, while of course they could feel pain, can they really evoke emotions in others? So you have founding fathers in our country actively dismantling the earliest notions of black classicism. But at the same time, like that was something that, I don't know if this is helpful for you, like, really grounded me in the field of like, oh, so like black women have been cl combating classics from Wheatley to Walker, like we're still doing it. So I guess yeah, yeah. that's just who I am. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I, I remain, remain kind of struck by Catherine's point about the narrowness of paths into stable employment in classics. And something that really strikes me is what sounds so wonderful about the Bridge to MA program is its consciousness of the importance of financial support. 
And I am wondering if we should think about what that looks like post-PhD, increasingly the path to the traditional normative classics career, the tenure track professorship, is no longer immediate. It requires one or two moves around the country for low pay and intense precarity. And even if those jobs have income, they don't make any sense for people with dependent family members, for people who don't have some kind of family wealth cushion in case disaster strikes. And given the way that race correlates with wealth in this country, the terrifying racial wealth gap in the United States, is that something that you think needs to be talked about if we're going to effectively include historically underrepresented groups in these jobs that now require these absurd financial hoops for people in their late 20s with a doctoral degree? That is insane when you say it out loud. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. Uh, I feel irresponsible directing students of any kind into a PhD program because there are no jobs. Now, what I want to say after that cheerful pronouncement is that I think one of the things one of the ways that the field could change is to stop thinking of teaching a secondary school as a fate worse than death. Look at Danny. <laughs> right? I, it's important. It's important. It's important work. And I, I don't want to put you down. I mean, I had this absolutely the same training, you know, that if it was sort of, you know, inculcation that uh, it's, it's just not interesting. It's a dead end. It's something that people can, you know, do if they can't do anything else. But there are, there are amazing people teaching high school right now and doing interesting and important work. And, um, I hope, I mean, one of the aims of this, this conversation as a beginning was to, to try to break down these, these silos, uh, to try to get people to stop introducing themselves to me as I'm just a high school teacher. Come on. I'm just an adjunct. You, you, you have a union. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's, I'm putting that out there. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm putting that out there. Um, then I'm going to. Um, so, I mean, I finished my PhD in 2012. So I spent a long, a lot of time teaching as a casual in Australia, which is, actually even worse than being adjunct in the US because it's only by semester by semester. And so, um, and they would never give me a year long contract in the, uh, from 2008 till 2016 when I left, I taught the same courses almost every year and I never had more than a, a single contract. Um, and when I went to Singapore, I actually didn't intentionally go to try and get a job at Yale and US, it just, that just sort of happened. Um, and it was a temporary position as well. And then when I did move to the US, um, I did think about what was it I enjoyed doing and I realized I've always loved teaching and I love teaching. Um, so I thought I would, um, I wanted to, to teach high school and I, I didn't see it as something that was like inferior to teaching at university. Um, I just, it, unfortunately, like my actual natural disposition wasn't suited to not high school teaching but the way high schools are run and operate. Um, and I think because I hadn't, I, you know, I, I'd been to school in Michigan when I was in like middle school and a little bit in high school, but by and large, my schooling was done uh, in Australia and the systems are quite different. And I just, and that was a very difficult decision to not stay in, in teaching as well. Um, and I think that there are alternative career paths to teaching you know, that's often presented as the other option. If, you, if you're if you not able to work in academia, well, then become a teacher. And I think that's an awesome option. But there are also so many other alternatives out there for how we can use our degrees. And um, we don't need to be limited. And I think that his, I guess, by and large, the field has been very 
um, you, you know, you feel like you are a failure if you decide not to stay in academia, if you're like, you know, make that decision, well, I can't just keep being an adjunct forever and I'm just not willing to do that. Then you do, you know, people kind of like, oh, you should just give it one more year. And you're like, I've already given it five or six years, you know, like there's a limit to, to how much one can do this. So I think there's lots of great options out there, but I think the uh, field, you know, academia needs to change its attitude to the fact that it's not a failure to leave and do something else with your life. And you can still do your research and you can still be involved with teaching or mentoring or tutoring or whatever. There's heaps of options out there. I wanted to say something um, to complement what you're saying. The fact that we think this as a failure means that all these people are willing to work as adjuncts in very low pay, terrible working conditions. And if we didn't uh, teach them that, then they would have said no to that crappy job. And then, you know, the problem would have been less of a problem. So I think it's a failure systemic and goes very deep. Just one more thing. Uh, hi, yeah, so just to comment on this because this is something I constantly am struggling with these days. Uh, yeah, you got me for like two more years left, it's when I'm out. Um, is that I think that uh, in terms of changing attitudes, because I think I know this is more of a comp than a question, but I'd love to know if you guys, if you guys agree. Real close. Yes. All right. Yeah. So this. Okay. Fine. Um, I'd love to know if you agree with me, but I really do think, and I we've been dancing around this, and it's hard to articulate. But in order to even change the attitude about that within academia, like that these these other paths, whatever they are, um, are not bad or failures. There needs to be an actual material demonstration from departments and from institutions. And that, you know, outlining, and I think this does come into like building, you know, relationships with other departments so that it's not just like, oh no, it's great, you know, do something else, that's fantastic. But it's like, okay, well, where's the money and how do I do something else? Because what's the connection? And if that's not outlined, then the attitude isn't going to change and there's no model or demonstration for that. So I don't know, like, if you guys have ideas about how to actually enact that, but I do think there has to be something very, like, tangible or like something that's like clearly demonstrated and supported financially in order to make those like bridges happen. I think that um, one of one of the things that we should do is um, fund graduate students to take on internships outside the academics and support them and, and have that be a part of their fellowship package, have that be a, a, you know, a way of doing graduate support. Um, and you know, there could be other things too, like creating a database of people who have uh, been in, in other fields, but I definitely think that there needs to be you know, support uh, for people making that transition and it, it can't just happen, you know, like, on their dime. I definitely think that, yeah. yeah. And I also want to bounce off what um, Sarah just said about um, databases of um, alumni who have uh, gotten their PhDs and could not find jobs in classics and have transitioned their uh, degrees into other uh, fruitful careers. I feel that um, while many universities acknowledge these students, but they don't put them on a forefront, it's always, oh, look, uh, so-and-so is a professor here over here, and um, we need to uh, be better at um, showing that uh, being a professor is not the only way to be successful with a PhD in classics. There are other ways to be successful with your PhD. There are other things to do with your PhD. And I think it would be um, very great for um, institutions to invite those students, especially who are outside of the field now, to come in so they can explain how they made the transition. That'd be very helpful. So it'd be less anxiety among people who are... Um, you know, dissertating now or writing their dissertations are on the job market and they, there is no path. They, you know, they feel like they're, they're drowning, you know. 
I mean, also a problem with not training teachers or not presenting secondary as an option and giving uh, teachers resources is it perpetuates this problem where you have people teaching who I just want all advanced students. So there's a, there's several factors involved in this, but Latin is unnecessarily treated as a gifted and honors class, and that all but ensures, like gifted and honors, whether it be through tracking in a public high school, uh, ability to go to a private school, but essentially by marketing this as some extremely um, fancy d thing, you're having it treated like the kind of course that people of color, marginalized people of color, do not have access to in public schools because they're tracked. And Latin requires no prior academic special preparation or anything, but what you have happening is there's this coded language that Latin is offered to the kids who are already in honors in AP, and that's joining a separate system um, versus what, what I did was say everybody should be able to take Latin. And from one semester to the next, the composition of my classroom was completely different. But I also have a teaching degree. I know how to differentiate. I know how to handle lots of different classroom management situations. I was comfortable in situations outside of an honors, homogenous. I need all the high flyers. And our, I'm, look how lucky I am to have all the best students. That mentality needs to change. And that's um, something kind of symbiotic, because at the post-secondary level, presenting high school teaching as a career that's helpful and also enjoyable uh, it, it's it's a very satisfying career. So I mean, at that end, not stigmatizing it, because then people can get the skills they need to come into a school and desegregate a program that's essentially segregated because of um, I mean, they call honors tracking second generation segregation, and Latin is plugged into that. So of all the things that have come up, I mean, that seems like something that would be very helpful is to get. Really, I'm not, I mean, a lot of teachers are very qualified, but their comfort zone is everybody looks the same, everybody has the same amount of wealth, everybody, and they, they, they don't want, um, they do not want a lot of students in the classroom who are not in the honors or gifted track, which tends to be very um, racialized, so. <clears throat> Nancy, I actually could not. Well, I can read your handwriting, but it, it's it's kind of the message is cryptic. <laughs> so, so um, I want to plug. Uh, well, I want to say I slipped out to go to the restroom, but I want to say in answer to your very potent question, you know, we have to keep people in in the, in the system, and it's not just admitting them, but keeping them. So, mentoring is really important, and the WCC has an intersectional. Uh, mentoring program with Classics and Social Justice, with Mountaintop and the LCC, and you can sign up to be a mentor or to be mentored. And not everybody would think of going to the Women's Classical Caucus, but it is, was much more simple, much simpler logistically to just expand that existing resource. So go there, look for mentoring, sign up, say what your interests are, what your strengths are, and we will hook you up. <laughs> Oh, and I just did also want to clarify really quickly that the tracking system isn't based on like actual intelligence. It's per it's based on perceived intelligence. So there is there are so many students who are so brilliant who've never been given the chance to do um, you know rigorous work because essentially they've been it's a segregated system. So I, I just want to clarify that I'm not saying if you have this. A lot of people assume oh they they will equate um, diversity in the classroom with the need to have an easier curriculum or a less rigorous curriculum or some gimmick way of teaching when really there's a whole lot of students um, who are extremely brilliant and, and do very, very well in Latin and really enjoy it who aren't given um, the option when they go sign up for classes because of how they've been tracked. So I had the distinct um, honor of being entrusted with my campus's Mellon Mays Fellowship Program for one year. Um, as sabbatical cover for a, a much more qualified and talented um, colleague. Uh, for those of you in the room who are unaware of Mellon Mays, Mellon Mays recruits in sophomore year of undergrad um, and then provides two years of structured programming for cohorts of 10 um, and, uh, um, of, and it, it recruits traditionally amongst African-American, Latino, and um, in, indigenous Americans. Um, 
with the idea of creating um, and expanding the future professoriate. And so the cohorts are usually in the humanities and social sciences, but also some of the earth sciences. So it's a diverse group of 10 students that I worked with intensely. But as I was being trained um, quickly to take this over for a year, one of the things that was emphasized to me is that I needed to communicate to these undergraduates that an essential part of training for the professoriate was learning to teach and discerning for oneself that one actually enjoyed teaching. Um, and so on our campus that looked like um, requirements to engage in peer tutoring or mentorship programs or working in elementary schools, whether that was voluntary or paid work was really dependent on individual circumstances. But the conversation within the mentoring program was, you are going to, if this is what you're going to do, you are going to be an educator. Um, now, what I hope is that when those students are going on to PhD programs, they are being continued to be supported as future educators. But when we only emphasize our esoteric research interests um, and that portion of it, and we reflect that to our students, then we are misrepresenting the very nature of the work at hand. Um, and so regardless of whether someone is going to end up teaching at the secondary level or the college level, um, owning that this, is a t that this is a career in education and actually emphasizing that I think is really key to breaking down the stigmatization and then also the racialized component. And that's a lesson I very much took from the wisdom of Mellon Mays, so I want to give credit to that program. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for all of this discussion and the panel and all of that. Um, and I just wanted to share some of the ways that I've been really thinking about this question of the value of classics in the humanities and putting in that larger context of like what is the intrinsic value of classics in the humanities as a way of making myself feel comfortable with how I'm presenting the field and doing recruitment and all that in a way that's not very self-interested for you know my classes need to fill or my department needs to get enough butts and seats. And the way that I advise students is to say, you know, classics is really interesting and useful in all of these different ways. And if you major in it, I think you would get a lot out of it, whoever you are. Um, but it's not the only place to get stuff that is interesting and useful. And what is important to me is that you find the thing that gives you the most, um, that gives you the opportunity to develop your skills and really to develop your humanity. Because for me, um, most of our students don't go to graduate school. We don't push that. Um, and I don't care if they become majors. I don't care if they become grad students or if they become faculty members. If that's what they want to do, then great. What I care about is for students to engage in classics in whatever way they can, because it gives them the skills and the ability to, to think about their own lives and think about what it means to be human. And I tell my students the story about how, um, so my brother, had bipolar disorder um, and took his own life about six years ago. And I had just been teaching the Ajax in myth class, um, literally days before I got the news. And I came back and I told my students, I said, look, this, or I didn't come back, I left for the rest of the term. And I wrote them a long email and I said, look, so this is why I'm leaving. Um, and what I've been talking about all semester is that my skills as a classicist and my ability to frame narratives and understand how narratives get constructed has helped me deal with this tragedy in my life in ways that my sisters, my parents, um, have not been able to do and took them much longer. It's my, these intellectual skills are useful to you in ways that are not only professionally useful but as a person. And that is the reason why I think it is valuable for as many students as possible to come into contact with this material. And it may be useful for them professionally in ways that they don't understand in terms of their ability to read closely, um, put their, you know, put things into context and all of that. Um, but I think if we put forth that message where it's like, this is about you and finding where you fit in 
with all of this stuff, and that's what we care about. And if you choose to go in this area, you know, whether it's graduate school and you decide that that's actually not the right fit for you for whatever reason, then you've gotten what you could get out of it that's useful to you. And so the paths are actually open in many more ways. And so when students are, are thinking about grad school, I say, that's great. Just, you know, like, here's the reality. Um, and as long as you go into graduate school thinking, you know what, whatever, at whatever point if I need to step off, then that's okay, because it is useful for me. I am not beholden to it. Um, I think that can alleviate some of the anxiety as well, where it's like, what is best for you and where do you fit? And no matter where you step off of the, you know, whether you stay on the path or step off, you will have gotten things that are useful to you. And if you want to go on a different path, that's okay too. Classics is not the end all be all of, of everything. Um, and, and there's lots of value to, to other things. Like there's other things I wish I knew. <laughs> and so I think that can help frame it in a more ethical kind of way. Um, that might address a lot of these these issues of um, yeah diversity as well as professional stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that um, lovely comment, and I definitely want to second everything you said, and I um, definitely try to encourage that in my class as well. And I feel similar to what you said that you know I um, lost my mother a few years back, and I do think also like studying the classics really helped me overcome that much more easily. I think maybe somebody else would. And I tell this to my students as well that you know reading these texts is about understanding, as you said, what it is to be human, about understanding human relationships. And we all have relationships, whether it's with the, with our families, with our friends, and this will give you the skills to really deal with everything you want in your life. And so one of the things that I think is really um, important is many of these students could do classics and another major. And so they could actually double major. And at least at Connecticut College, we had tons of double majors. And I think this was perfect for them. Like they could be gaining maybe some skills that they feel are really crucial maybe for you know their financial stability, but at the same time, they could also be gaining the skills that are crucial for them to deal with everything that life will bring them as humans. And, you know, that way you have multiple ways, you know, to navigate life. And we all need those ways, you know, no matter what. So I think that's a really good point and something that we should all be sort of emphasizing in our classes if we want to bring, you know, more diversity and to have more meaningful interactions with people from different backgrounds. Um, this has been a great panel. Thank you to all of you. Um, and I was, I've been thinking about what you asked, you know, what is, which is the crucial, crucial question, what does reparations look like? And, um, and Danny's showing the, the example of, um, well, you just take it out of the special elite track. Latin is not special, different for a special type of person, special type of student. Um, so to me, it's, it's eva valuing all the individuals in front of us and, and the, the issue of making a college teaching career more prestigious than a high school career is in that same vein. Like the, every individual in front of us, no matter which classroom it is, is valu a valuable individual, and it's a valuable work to do. And on the other end of the spectrum, where um, you know, as as people of color, women um, go up the the career ladder, and the and the um, possibilities and the opportunities narrow. And um, there's the the adjunct track again. Um, the elitism of of academia insists that the the only people whose not not just teaching but whose intellectual research contributions that are worthy of monetary support are those who have tenure or are in a tenure track and the re and the rest of you you're not you're not ever going to get paid to do research you're not this is because because you didn't make that cut then your contribution is not going to be um, ever valued or supported. And um, so it, it, the, the systemic, like, oh, it's just systemic, we'll never get over it. But yet the system 
is made up of individuals that can make the change. So. I, I'm afraid we have to stop. I hope um, that people will get each other's contact information and keep talking. Um, this was um, this was our dream, <laughs> this conversation. And a, a recurrent theme has been, we need to talk. We need to reconsider. We need to think about what we value. What do we really value? And who, whom do we value? So I appreciate so much everyone's contribution, your conversation, your open-mindedness. And uh, Danny, would you like to say goodbye? Yeah, no, I mean, just thanks for coming. And um, I just, I mean, I hope you really think about what you can do, because there's, I think, as classicists, we like to think and write, but really there's there are things we can do, all of us, um, in ways that will benefit um, the field and will help um, correct this injustice. Um, and, you know, we'll just, we'll just make classics a, a better place for everybody. So go do something. <laughs>